You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Hey, I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Well Show. Today, we're going to be doing an Ask Kathy segment, which means I'm going to be answering questions that we get on my Instagram page, Kathy Fetke, and also just on a regular basis at Real Wealth. So here are a few questions that we've received recently. The first one is, what is a syndication? Okay, so a syndication is basically a group investment. It's where several investors come together and they buy something bigger than they could do on their own. But it's different than a JV. Um, Normally with a syndication, there's one manager or several managers who are the GPs, the general partners, and they do the acquisition, the renovation. They basically manage the project. And the LPs, the limited partners, invest in that project. So the limited partners are passive. They are just contributing money to the deal. And the general partners are doing the work. Uh, So that is a syndication. Because the general partners are taking uh, passive income from investors, it is regulated by the Securities Exchange Commission, the SEC. So anytime anyone ever takes money from investors and those investors are passive, They have to understand that this is regulated by the SEC and there are really strict rules around that. So even if you're doing a JV partnership or it's just a couple of people, not a big group, um, let's say you're having a friend invest with you and all they do is invest money and you find the deal and you do all the work, you're really kind of um, on the line there for uh, SEC regulation. So you just need to be really careful. You're supposed to file with the SEC and get approval for ever taking uh, private money or investor money. Now, it's different if um, you're being loaned the money. And I think this is a really important difference. Let's say you and your friend or brother or parent or whatever want to do a deal together and the other person wants to lend you the money and that money is secured against the property, that may not be so uh, regulated by the SEC. It's just a loan. It's secured. Uh, I would talk to an attorney to be sure, but that may fall under different regulation. Uh, But the bottom line, I think you can understand from what I'm saying is that it's always best to get an attorney. And we have so many that we recommend at Real Wealth. You can just go to realwealth.com and click on the connect page and it'll have a a whole list of uh, attorneys who specialize in that. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. What are good deals today? Okay, so where can you find good deals today? I know there's a lot of people who have stayed on the sidelines wondering if um, if it is a good time to buy now and if there's a recession around the corner and if they should just wait till prices come down. So I am going to go over this. I actually did a full webinar on a, you know my forecast for 2024 and you can find that at realwealth.com also under the resources and that would be under the learn tab. Uh, so I go over in detail why I think uh, there's certain opportunities in 2024 that are better than others. Okay, so depending on what asset class you're investing in, uh, you may or may not see prices come down. So waiting will do you no good in some situations and, and it might in others. So let's talk about the residential real estate and specifically one to four units. That's mainly uh, homes, single family homes, duplexes, fourplexes. Those are financed differently than commercial loans. Anything that's over five units is a commercial loan. And in many cases, those commercial loans are an adjustable rate mortgages. Not all, but a lot of them. Uh, But one to four units, the majority have been on fixed rate mortgages because why wouldn't you? For the past, I don't know, 10 years, it's not been that different to get a fixed rate mortgage versus an adjustable. In fact, in some cases, it might even have been um, cheaper or just, well, maybe not cheaper, but um, just as good to get a 30-year fixed rate versus a, you know, five-year or something. So most people went for the 30-year. 
I know Rich and I would have these conversations a lot, like, oh, you know, it's a little bit cheaper to go with the adjustable, but not that much cheaper. And you don't know where rates are going. So let's just go with the 30 year fixed. And then of course, when rates went down to the two and 3% level, a lot of people refinanced into those fixed rates because they knew that uh, that was unusual and they'd probably never see that opportunity again. So what we have in the residential space is a whole lot of people, millions of people who are locked into incredibly low rates, historically low rates. And for the first time, uh, you know, homeowners are in the, not the first time, but a first time in a long time that homeowners are in the best position ever, like ever in history. Homeowners have the lowest payment compared to income than they have in decades. And that's because they're in these low fixed payments and that's not going to change. And recently we've been seeing wage growth. So homeowners have maybe been seeing their income go up, but their expenses are staying fixed with that 30 year fixed rate mortgage. So people who are waiting on the sidelines, and I see this a lot, hoping that home prices will come down. I'm afraid that's probably not going to happen and you'll be waiting a long time. And there is evidence of that. Uh, when we've seen interest rates double, if not triple it, sometimes we still saw home prices go up and that really shocked even the Federal Reserve. They weren't expecting that. So the higher interest rates went, uh, the less people wanted to move. So they, you know, they have the ability to just stay put. Or if they, if they are going to move, maybe they'll just consider renting the house out because they don't want to lose that really low payment in case they ever want to come back. Or they just might learn how to be a landlord and cash flow. So we saw a very stuck market, a very low inventory as a result. And when you have low inventory, but demand, we have a, a really large, one of the largest groups of people right now who are at first time home buying age, the millennials, the largest group of the millennials is now at first time home buying age, having families, having children. They would love to have a home. All the while that market has been stuck. So if you're sitting on the sidelines, hoping home prices will come down. Sure, there are my markets where that's happening. New York, I believe. I know Austin, home prices have come down. But most places all across the country have gone up. And that's probably not going to change until we see more inventory come on the market. And when is that going to happen? You know, you'd have to build millions of homes uh, to change. And, and that's probably not going to happen anytime soon because it's been really costly to build new homes. I know we're bringing on more supply into the market, but uh, it's going to be a while before there's equilibrium, before there's balance between supply and demand. And as long as there's not enough supply and there's demand, you'll probably see prices go up or at least stabilize. So that means if you want to be buying homes, one to four units, you're just going to either have to find a distress situation um, or you're just going to have to buy and, you know, not get as good a deal as you might have before, but know that you're buying something that's in great demand. And there's a huge amount of people looking for a place to live. And if they can't own it, they're going to rent it. Uh, so it's still really a big opportunity. However, on the commercial side of things, so five units or more, or commercial real estate in general, that could be office, storage, um, industrial most of those loans, not all, but most are on adjustable rates. And some people did not um, do, you know, did not plan carefully and uh, didn't, didn't realize that rates would go up as much as they did. So you have a lot of people in the commercial real estate industry. And I know we've talked about this a lot here, so I'm sorry if I'm boring you, but I'm just answering questions that we get online. Um, th those People in commercial real estate are really suffering because their payments have adjusted and they have gone up. And when you have rates going up so dramatically, you're going to see an effect on commercial real estate because that means there's less, less of a return and the value goes down. So that is what I'm expecting. I am actually on the sidelines for those type of properties. I don't think that um, I certainly don't think office and, and not all multifamily have found their floor yet because there's still a lot of people who own those properties who don't want to discount. They don't want to lose any money. And yet the buyers are saying, well, it doesn't work for me. These numbers don't work. I need you to either come down on price or I need a better interest rate. Something has to give for me to want to buy this property. So it's still in that fluctuating place. And I'm being really cautious 
and careful about getting into commercial property. But we are keeping a close eye on it. And I thought we would already be diving in by this time when when I talked about it last year. But uh, I'm still just being cautious. And it could be middle to the end of the year where we start to really take that seriously. But in the meantime, we're busy enough buying one to four units, helping others buy one to four unit properties. And we, we're still, well, we just closed out our single family rental fund. Uh, so that is not an opportunity anymore, but we'll probably open another one. But at Real Wealth, we're constantly helping people buy one to four unit properties nationwide where there's tremendous demand for that. Now, what and where? This is the question we get a lot. So where would be where there's demand, where there's growth. We look for job growth, population growth, and uh, infrastructure growth. I want to see that the city is investing in itself. I want to see new freeways, new hospitals, new schools, new businesses moving to the area. That kind of growth kind of means eventually there'll probably be an increase in home value and demand for the property. Uh, And, you know, really good landlord laws that are in favor of the landlord. Uh, where I live in California, they're more in favor of the tenant. So that makes it hard when you're a landlord, when the laws are not in your favor. And just overall migration patterns, which are to the Southeast. So we still really love all those areas in the Southeast, Um, Texas, Florida, the Carolinas. um, We like Alabama. There's a lot of really good markets there. And you can find out more and get a connection to our teams there by just going to our website at realwellshow.com. Okay. Uh, how, how do you find the deal and how do you make it work? This has been a big question. You know, can you find cash flow? Are you still able to get appreciation? Are prices going to go higher in some areas? Uh, so I already said the areas that we like, but in those areas, we want to find some kind of distress. And, and that just distress may not look like what you think it might look like. When we talk about distressed housing, we're thinking about properties that are in need of a lot of work. Maybe they're older. Uh, You know, maybe somebody, you know, bank wouldn't finance them so we can come in and pay cash. That's what we did with our single family rental fund. We'd find older properties. Maybe they didn't have a kitchen that was working. We could get a great deal, fix them up. Now they're bankable and now they're livable. The values go up significantly. Uh, But that's not the only kind of distress Another distress that we've seen over the past year is with builders. So a lot of builders, you know, had great plans. Um, There's a need for housing and then bam, interest rates went up and they were sitting on a lot of inventory they couldn't sell because as much as people wanted those properties, their clientele could no longer afford them. So if we could find the builders who are in distress and they're sitting on inventory they need to sell because builders are different than home sellers. They are in the business of selling. They need to sell. They're sitting on construction loans they need to get out of that balloon or are just really expensive. They cannot sit on on inventory for very long. So if you see that kind of distress, now you've got a property that's not distressed at all. You've got a builder that's distressed. So that is kind of the focus that we've had at Real Wealth for the past year is um, offering a solution to these builders and saying, look, we've got investors who would love to buy new homes. Uh, Buying a new home is the best kind of investment because there's just not going to be a lot of issues generally with that home. You know, you, you, everything's new and tenants love to move into new homes. So it's, it's great for an out of state landlord specifically to be able to buy a new home that they don't have to worry too much about. Also, there's much lower insurance on new homes. And if you can negotiate with the builder who's sitting on this inventory and needs to get rid of it, then that's really a win-win solving their problem and solving our problem. So how do you deal with the distress? Well, you can try to negotiate a lower price, but generally builders don't want to do that. They're more apt to give upgrades um, and not lower the price because that means the next houses they have to sell, they have to lower the price, right? That's, that's the new comp. So they'd rather, you know, do something else. And a lot of times what they'll do is, like I said, they'll give upgrades or in this case, what we wanted was just a lower interest rate. So it's like, hey, instead of giving us an upgrade because our tenants are perfectly happy with a new house, it doesn't have to have all these fancy upgrades, give us that money and buy down the interest rate. And now we've got a deal. Now we can make this property cash flow and uh, and you get you know rid of your inventory. 
and we're able to provide housing for tenants that makes sense. So that's been really our focus at Real Wealth. And it's been such a win-win for our, our clients, for the tenants, and for the builders who needed to move that inventory. Because I can tell you as a builder, we have subdivisions all across the country. You can't sit on that inventory. It is uh, really detrimental to your project. So you got to sell it. And sometimes even if it's not at much of a profit, it's got to move. So uh, that's been a really, really wonderful opportunity for people. And I think I've mentioned it before that Rich and I bought a duplex that was brand new through our Jacksonville team. And that's when, been one of our best performing properties. And we just bought it last year. So you, you could say it was at a really high price, probably the highest price that that area has seen in Florida. And yet, because of interest rate, we were able to get down to under 5%. Um, I think it was, yeah, it was low, um, that it, it actually cash flows really well. And insurance is way lower in Florida on new homes. So when you look at cash flow, you want to you want to look at it over time, not just on the pro forma. And this is a mistake that a lot of people make is they'll look at the pro forma and say, well, gosh, I could buy this property in... I don't know. Let me pick on someplace, Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, that it's, I can get it for cheaper and the rents are higher and I'm going to get a higher cash flow. And that may be true unless the property's older and is going to be in, in need of a lot of repair over time. And you're getting nickel and dimed every month as things break down and, or the value just never goes up. Uh, whereas you might have a new property that, you know, the pro forma doesn't look that great at the beginning, but then you notice over time, wow, I didn't have to fix anything, you know, and my insurance costs were lower, my property taxes were lower, and I, I got more equity growth. So overall, I've made more money. Now, we did a single family fund before this one, um, before this Texas one, and closed it out a few years ago. And, uh, and I basically tested this theory. We wanted to balance out the fund and have high growth properties like in Florida and um, Georgia, then we wanted the high cash flow properties to make sure that we had enough cash flow. And that those were in Detroit and Ohio and so forth. What we found after five years of holding those properties and selling them is that indeed the Midwest properties cash flowed really well. Uh, but the, um, the properties in the Southwest Ha just made so much money in growth because that is the area where people are moving. So when we really worked out the numbers, all the expenses in all, all, you know, expenses versus income, those Southwest properties made about a 28% return annually, whereas the Midwest properties was between six and 8%. So over the long haul, you know, there's a lot more to look at besides just that monthly income versus expenses. Because if you got a bunch of expenses or you can't sell it for very much, are you really making that much money versus enough cash flow to cover costs, but you're in some cases making 50 to a hundred thousand dollars a year on equity growth, you know, so these are things to weigh out. Um, so yes, there are still deals out there. There's lots of deals. What you have to look for is the distress, the need, um, what, how can you solve a problem? You know, what, who's challenged right now? And right now, the people who are not challenged are the typical homeowner. Now, there's always going to be homeowners that are running into some kind of personal problem, like maybe divorce or um, and they say the four Ds, divorce, drugs, uh, death, <laughs> um, depression. I know there's another one too. But anyway, these things do happen and people sometimes just need to get out of their properties or they just can't make their more monthly mortgage payment. People in distress, it's a very low percentage, but they still exist. So another opportunity is not foreclosures. Uh, that does, They don't end up going to foreclosure generally because properties have gone up so much in value. There's so much demand. All People just have to put them on the market and sell them and, and can make some money or they don't you know, get their credit wiped out. But if you can find out who is in distress and you can work out a deal with them in case they are maybe facing foreclosure, you could buy that property and relieve them. Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities out there. I don't do that. I don't do the subject to or the um, wholesaling simply because I don't have time. Uh, but if that's something you're interested in, there is opportunity there in pre-foreclosure, not post-foreclosure. They generally don't go back to the banks. If you're looking for 
um, education on that. I've got some really good referrals for people who can teach you how to do that. Okay. What other questions do we have? How is a syndication structured? Okay. This is is a great question. Um, Lots of different ways. Uh, Syndications are structured completely differently depending on who the general partners are. They can just do a straight split. Um, That's actually how we did it with our our fund is my partner in Texas said, look, you know, I'm able to find these incredible deals. We're getting these huge discounts on properties. I'm doing all the renovation and managing these properties. Investors can come in and basically invest alongside of me, but I'm not going to give any preferential treatment. It's like, you get to be my partner and we split the profits. Now that's not a typical syndication, but that is how she wanted to structure it. And we were like, yeah, let's let's do that. So um, the first cash flow that came out and um, and the first profits would go to paying back the initial investor capital, and then after that we just would split. And um, you know that worked out. And and then of course there's the fees that you charge for legal fees and accounting fees and so forth that comes out first too. So you want to make sure you understand first and foremost what is what are the fees within this syndication because that can change everything. If the syndicator or the operator is charging overhead, you know, their office staff, their airplane, you know, their cars, you know, then a lot of the profits will get eaten up by all those expenses. So you want to be really clear about what those fees are and what is covered. Usually there's a one to 2% acquisition fee, one to 2% asset management fee. Um, In our case, the um, acquisition fee was higher because we were kind of including all the upside of us finding and renovating the properties. We were including that in acquisition fee. But again, it can it can be structured so many different ways, but the key is making sure you understand that structure. Maybe you need a, an attorney to review it with you. Another way that we're doing it right now with, uh, with one of our syndications, if you want to find out about it, it's at growdevelopments.com. That's my, my development company, growdevelopments.com. And we do syndications in there. Now, as you probably know, there's a great need for new housing. And my partner, Fred, we've been building houses together for 14 years now. So he's tried and true. We've done 14 different developments. And this recent one, he we weren't doing anything for the last three or so years because the land prices were too high and there was too much competition. It just didn't make sense. And Fred only wants to do deals that are just home runs, basically. Well, um, once interest rates went up, we started to see distress again and opportunity. So a uh, the city planners or the mayor or some I can't remember who did who, but called Fred because he, they knew about our other projects. We have projects in Reno and Bozeman, and said, "Hey, we need new housing here in Oregon because in Klamath Falls the um, Air Force is expanding and they don't have enough housing." So they said, can you come up here and build new houses? So he went up and looked around and he found a distressed situation. Somebody who was in the middle of a development, they'd gotten, they'd taken all the risk, bought the land, developed it, put in the roads, the uh, the lots are finished, it's all permitted, ready to build. But um, the interest rates made it impossible and he wasn't a professional builder. He was actually a farmer who had land and was trying to be a developer. So Fred came in and said, well, look, I am a developer and I can finish this out for you, but we don't want to take on the developer risk. So we're just going to do an option. We're going to do an option to buy these lots. We're going to find buyers for the homes. We'll build the homes and we won't pay for the land until the final closing. And the farmer agreed because it's like how this farmer can get out of this project. So that's our latest indication. It's an option. We don't have to take on any of the developer risk. We don't even have to close on the land until we built the houses and we've got the final buyer and we've got a bunch of pilots in the air force who would like a nice home overlooking the lake in Klamath Falls. So the way we structured this is the investors get a 12 and a half percent preferred return. That means preferred return means that the investor gets paid first before the uh, general partners get their share. Uh, But before that comes fees. So fees get paid first, then the preferred return, and then the profits are split after that. And then capital first. (laughs) I really confused that. But the way that the waterfall goes is um, fees are paid. So attorney fees, you know, for setting everything up, you need an SEC attorney to set these up. 
um, accounting fees. You know, we've got K-1s and lots of accounting when there's multiple investors. Uh, we have to pay the gen- general contractor. Uh, we have to pay the bookkeeper, all these things. These fees come out first. Then uh, as we sell homes, that money goes to pay back the investor capital. Once the capital is paid back, and that happens in the in year one, I mean, the beginning of the return of capital happens in year one because we don't have to buy the land or close on it. So we get to take the profit immediately and return it to investors. So capital back first, then the 12 and a half preferred return on that money per year. And then at the end, we split profits, but we split it a little bit. So the investors get a high pref and then a lower split of, of profit. Uh, but that way, if the project takes longer, the investors are still getting that 12 and a half percent. So I, I think it's in the investor's favor to do it this way. But lots of other syndicators do it differently. They might do an 80-20 split where the investor gets 80 percent and the operator gets 20 percent. Yeah, the investor gets 80 and then 20 plus a pref. You know, there's all kinds of ways to structure a syndication. So the most important thing is that you understand that structure that hopefully you review it with an attorney if you don't understand it and uh, and that you really understand the business plan. And if you're not 100%, I would really make sure you have someone look at it who does understand it. Because let's say it's an apartment, you maybe want to have someone just review it and make sure that the numbers make sense. Because we've pretty much turned down every apartment that we've seen over the last few years passed on some really good ones, unfortunately, but passed on some really bad ones too, because I was just uncertain about the market and it seemed a little risky. So I hope that helps answer your questions. My time is up. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Kathy Fetke. This was the Ask Kathy segment. We do this, I don't know, every few months or so. So if you have questions, you can you can find me on Instagram, uh, which is at Kath, Kathy Fetke, just my name. Or you can go to growdevelopments.com and, and send some questions or, you know, just directly to, to us at Real Wealth. Okay. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.